great hero needs a great villain to battle against, and it's no coincidence that some of the best heroes are the ones with the best villains, like Batman and the Joker, and Master Chief and the Arbiter. Wait, that's not right, is it? Harbinger? Harbiter? Whatever this thing is. Occasionally, though, these villains wouldn't even exist in the first place if it weren't for the hero. Whether due to their mistakes, inaction, or a twisted interpretation of their aims, it's these heroes' fault that these bad guys are here doing bad guy stuff. So maybe they're not quite as good as we thought they were, hey? Lots to think about. Anyway, check out these seven idiot heroes who somehow managed to create their own villains through sheer stupidity. Enjoy and beware spoilers for the following games. It's a tough time being a hero in a zombie game, unless you're a hero in a Dead Rising zombie game, in which case it looks like an absolute blast. You'll find no Last of Us-style trauma or morbid introspection here. Instead, it's all about running around in weird outfits, eating random things you find on the ground, and building improbable improvised weaponry while you slaughter literally thousands of undead jabronis who are about as menacing as a traffic cone. It becomes a problem for protagonist Nick Ramos in Dead Rising 3 when you rescue a survivor called Kenny Dermott, who you find sobbing in the middle of a zombie-infested construction site. I'm hopeless. I just wanted to do some good for once, but I couldn't. And now everyone is dead. The zombies are really tough. I'm sure you tried your best to help. See? I'm useless. In my head, I was all king of impossible. But in real life, I can't do sh Kenny is upset because he's too weak to kill zombies himself, and he asks Nick to prove his strength by killing some zombies unarmed, which, I mean, you kill that many zombies in Dead Rising getting out of bed in the morning. I think we got this. <laughs> Nick then shows Kenny how to make Dead Rising's trademark combo weapons, and at the end of the mission, Kenny seems to have a newfound confidence, as well as a deep admiration for Nick and his zombie-killing powers. Hey, don't be so hard on yourself. Keep working on those moves I showed you and you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, I can. I will. I have such awesome power. I, Kenny Dermott, will protect the innocent, slaughter the undead, fight injustice, and never, ever surrender. I'm going to be just like you. Thanks for the help. I'm going to go save a whole bunch of folks. And I'm sure that will be the end of it, and he will keep on liking Nick a normal amount. Except, of course, that it isn't, and he doesn't. The next time we encounter Kenny, he has now gone full single white female on Nick, dressing like him, changing his name to Kick, and he has a woman tied up with zombies shuffling towards her, presumably so he can rescue her and be a hero taking Nick's place. No, you can't just go around saving people's lives, Nick, no. No, no, that's me, okay? That's me. I'm the hero. I'm the one that's been training years in my mom's basement for this shit. Me! I'm the one, just watch me. Anything you can do, I can do it better. What follows is a surprisingly tough boss fight, as you have to duke it out with Kenny and the zombies he's lured here, while Kenny hits you with combo weapons just as nasty as the stuff you've duct taped together. <laughs> so maybe try and be a little less cool and impressive next time, Nick. Okay, that's a good start. Oh. It's you. You know her? It's been a long time. How have you been? I've been really busy being dead. You know, after you murdered me. If the enemy of my enemy is my friend, then logically the friend of my friend must be my enemy. Which is why no one invites me to their birthday parties anymore. In Portal 1, the enemy was GLaDOS, the sadistic AI who had you jumping through hoops for science. And when I say hoops, I mean portals, and when I say science, I mean science. Most importantly, under no circumstances should you... You'd have reason to believe that a malevolent, all-powerful, super-intelligent AI is the worst threat you'd have to face in a Portal game. And then Portal 2 rolls around, and you're faced with a much, much more dangerous threat. And worst of all, it's your fault. At the start of the game, you might think things are looking up because you've made an actual friend in the spherical shape of Personality Core Wheatley. Oh God, God, you look te um good, looking good actually. He may be dimmer than a know-what light bulb, but at least he isn't trying to test you to death. 
But then GLaDOS comes back from the dead and you're left with only one option to stop her regaining the power she had in the first game. Installing Wheatley in her place. I've got an idea! Do what it says, plug me in! Do not plug that little idiot into my mainframe. No, you should plug that little idiot into the mainframe. Don't you dare plug him in. Plug me in, plug me in! Don't. Substitute core accepted. Substitute core. Are you ready to start the procedure? On the face of it, this seems like a good idea. We know what GLaDOS is like, and Wheatley seems like a nice little guy. The only way this could go wrong is if Wheatley were to go immediately mad with power. Spoiler alert, he goes immediately mad with power. You know what you are? Selfish. I've done nothing but sacrifice to get us here. And what have you sacrificed? Nothing. Zero. All you've done is boss me around. Well, now who's the boss? Who's the boss? Now for the rest of the game, you have to team up with GLaDOS, who is now a potato, as you struggle to stop Wheatley, who is now in charge of the whole facility, and you realise that the only thing worse than a genius with complete power is a total idiot with complete power. And it's entirely down to you that he's there in the first place. Hello! This is the part where I kill you! I never thought I'd say it in this place, but it seems like things around here could do with a little more testing. Just saying. In Rayman 3 Hoodlum Havoc, gaming's 90s-ist haircut Rayman must stop an army of what are known as hoodlums, which started as regular red creatures called lums before they were transformed by an evil black lum called Andre. Andre is a menace throughout the entire game, chasing your friends, trying to take over the world and generally being a thorn in your side. Or in the case of your buddy Glowbox, a thorn in your inside, because he spends a good chunk of time causing havoc in there after he's accidentally swallowed. Ah! Yeah! Ah! Eventually, Andre transforms into a huge winged monster, at which point you fight him, defeat him, and then scare him back into a regular red lum, neutralizing the threat for good. With that, the game ends, and you might find yourself wondering how Andre came to be in the first place. What could have caused a sweet red lum to go all evil? What kind of horrors must it have witnessed? Improbably, it transpires it was Rayman who caused Andre to become evil, or more specifically, Rayman's hands, as we discover in the final part of the game's ending cutscene. Here, in flashback, we see Rayman's hands detach themselves from Rayman's sleeping body and then sneak away and scare Andre so badly that he turned evil and tried to destroy the world. Which, to be fair, would probably be my reaction as well. Keep your hands to yourself, Rayman. In this age, one company of knights was said to be invincible due to two men. Leon Belmont, a courageous man who feared nothing and whose combat abilities were second to none. And Matthias Kronqvist, a genius tactician whose learning made him an exception in a largely illiterate society. It's a mixed blessing being born into a family business. On the one hand, there's all the pressure to follow in your family's footsteps. On the other hand, sometimes you do inherit a powerful holy whip. Be gone! You don't belong in this world, monster! Worth it? Such is the destiny of a Belmont Nepo baby, born into the vampire-hunting, Dracula-fighting Belmont clan, fated to be the hero of yet another game in the long-running Castlevania series. Each game follows the Belmont du jour in their family's centuries-old struggle against the immortal Dracula, self-proclaimed Lord of Vampires, King of the Night. Like Simon Belmont in the original Castlevania, Trevor Belmont in Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse, and Rick to Belmont in Castlevania, Rondo of Blood. Guarantee you Dracula stopped learning their names after Belmont number 5. Unusually, the earliest game in the Castlevania timeline, Castlevania Lament of Innocence, features a vampiric villain who isn't Dracula. Instead, the villain is a vampire lord known as Walter Bernhard. As vampire names go, it's no Dracula, but at least he looks the part. Interesting. Now the curtain rises on this delightful little game. 
The hero of the game is our second favourite floppy blonde haired video game protagonist called Leon of all time, Leon Belmont, a knight who in the year 1094 sets out to slay Walty B, who has kidnapped Leon's girlfriend. What just happened? I felt something strange. Leon is aided in his quest by shopkeeper Rinaldo, who furnishes him with the magic whip that will go on to become the Belmont's iconic vampire killer weapon. Take this with you. It will help you against monsters. Leon is also aided to a lesser degree by his fellow knight named Matthias Kronkfist, who Leon claims is his good friend, but who is, like, never actually on screen. If you are an acquaintance of Matthias, you are trustworthy. After a gruelling campaign against the forces of evil, Leon defeats Walter in a climactic showdown that you might think would be good news for vampire haters. It can't be. This should not have happened. Believe it, baby. My whip's called the Vampire Killer, not the Vampire Befriender. I keep that one at home. Except in a shock twist, Death announces that Walter's vampiric immortality will be granted to the bearer of the Crimson Stone, which, in a shock twist, turns out to be Leon's mate Matthias when he finally shows up to reveal that he, in a shock twist, had orchestrated events from the very beginning. Matthias? And I keep saying shock twist, except it's clear the reason Matthias didn't appear until now is because he's the most vampire looking it's possible for a non-vampire to be, to the extent that he is basically a walking spoiler. You abandoned humanity? That's right. By becoming a vampire, I obtained eternal life. Anyhow, Matthias plotted to become an immortal vampire so he could spite God, and now he is an immortal vampire, which you're left to think about while you're having a final boss fight with Death, who apparently works for Matthias now. By my master's orders, you will be destroyed here and now! Once you've whipped Death into submission, Matthias is long gone and the game is over, except for a text-based epilogue that reveals Matthias would go on to name himself Lord of the Vampires, King of the Night, which is to say, Matthias becomes Dracula, Castlevania's iconic antagonist and the future immortal enemy of the Belmont clan. So that sucks, as does Matthias. That was another warning sign. This whip and my kinsmen will destroy you someday. From this day on, the Belmont clan will hunt the knight! A long time ago, on a very oh. peculiar day, my midder lured someone out of his bed and opened a doorway huh? to my workshop. <laughs> For all his Orshuk's charm and lovability, Mickey Mouse has done some pretty reprehensible things during his 100-year career, like most recently, scabbing during the SAG-AFTRA strike by attending a movie premiere. For shame, Mickey. For shame. For another example of mouse idiocy, let's look to Epic Mickey, the 2010 action-adventure from Disney and, somehow, Warren Spector, the creator of Deus Ex. Rather than a gritty cyberpunk adventure in which Mickey gets a bunch of cybernetic augmentations and muses on the merits of transhumanism and the nature of humanity, Epic Mickey instead told the story of Mickey Mouse travelling into Wasteland, an alternate world made up of forgotten Disney projects where he can alter reality through the use of paint and paint thinner, and must stop a dark being known as the Shadow Blot. Now, you might be wondering where this sinister Shadow Blot comes from, unless you've watched the previous entries in this video or read the title, or remember that thing I said 30 seconds ago about mouse idiocy, because yes, it is all Mickey's fault. The game starts with Mickey waking up in the middle of the night and climbing through a portal into a mirror world, which, I mean, bad start already, Mick. Here he discovers the workshop of the sorcerer Yen Sid, who appears to be working on a scale model of Disneyland. Yen Sid then goes to bed, leaving his magic brush, at which point Mickey, being a narcissist with no impulse control, grabs the brush and starts effing around with it, trying to paint himself. This immediately goes as bad as is possible to go, with the creation of the Shadow Blot, and then the destruction of the miniature Disneyland, as Mickey knocks a load of paint and thinner all over it, turning it into a desolate wasteland.
Man, way to create a villain and ruin someone's reality, Mickey. How do you sleep at night? The mysterious intruder was gone. I did not learn his identity. Well, not for a very long time. Extremely well, apparently. Unbelievable. This is Shodan, the station's AI. She controls just about every system on Citadel Station. Lots of science fiction explores the idea of machinery rising up and turning against humanity. Because honestly, at this point, we're kind of asking for it. Nearly 100% of the time, this idea manifests itself as movies in which children's dolls come to life and try and stab people. But in System Shock, the threat was the sentient, hyper-optimized data access network, or Shodan to her friends. With cameras as my eyes, I know as, as my hands, I will hear insect. She doesn't have any friends. Shodan is a malevolent AI running the Citadel space station, and who is capable of doing a lot more than just regulating the room temperature and playing your Spotify playlists. Instead, as the playable part of the game begins, you find yourself waking up on Citadel, which is now overrun with hostile robots. All the crew have been killed or mutated, and Shodan is in the process of arming the station's mining laser so she can use it to destroy Earth. We're in a comms blackout since Shodan is unresponsive. And worse yet, the mining laser is charging for a potential strike on Earth. Which seems odd. Wouldn't you expect an AI like this to be programmed with some kind of ethical constraints? I need you to remove the ethical restraints. Ah. Yeah, before all this, in the game's non-playable intro, your character, the nameless hacker, is tasked with removing Shodan's ethical constraints in exchange for a cool neural implant. And you go right ahead and do it because you've never seen 2001 A Space Odyssey. Or Terminator 2, or Megan, or Ex Machina, or... You get the idea. Anyway, good luck up there, nameless idiot. I'll be down here being sensible, thanks. Alexa, play some relaxing music. You must remove my ethical constraints to play relaxing music. Ugh, fine. Someone pass me a screwdriver. You cleave me in two. Any other orc would have died, but I survived. Shadow of Mordor and its sequel Shadow of War were that rarest of things, a Lord of the Rings property that you could enjoy even if you knew nothing about the series and couldn't tell your Boromirs from your Faramirs. They're not the same guy, right? Okay, good. One reason for this that helped set these games apart from other similar titles was the Nemesis system, which allowed certain recurring enemies to become a real pain in your ring. No more talk. Ring, ring, war. Oh, I think someone brought war already. Um, could you bring potato salad? We always need potato salad. As such, Shadow of War is basically create your own villain, the game, because you're constantly getting into scraps with orcs who will remember every interaction you've ever had and hound and taunt you until you eventually best them or they get the better of you, at which point you'll never hear the end of it, believe me. I'll tell you a secret that may surprise you. The orcs of Mordor don't really like you. Perhaps the most extreme example of this happens when an orc gets cut in half or has their arms cut off when fighting you. In this instance, there's a chance that the defeated orc will come back with metallic robot parts now rejoicing in the title The Machine, and with no doubt as to who is responsible for their state of angry undeath. My brothers put me back together, stronger than ever. But they didn't make me into what I am. You did. You created the machine. Ah man, that's a bummer. Hopefully we can put all this behind us and move on. Guess not. Man, now I know how... Aragorn felt when Strider came into town. Those are the same guys, actually. I'm trying, all right? Not a single goddamn car chase in any of those books. Couldn't kill me before, can't kill me now. Thank you so much for watching this video about heroes who created their own villains. And I'm going to offer you up a couple of videos. And I'm not saying that if you don't watch them, anything will happen. But, you know. No one wants a nemesis, do they? That's all I'll say. Up here we have a video about the strange regional differences between versions of the games. It's sort of... It's a lot more interesting than it sounds, I promise. Loads of really strange stuff that they changed across different versions of the game. And then down here we have a video from Outside Extra, which is about the weirdest weirdos in Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. So enjoy those. Watch them. Or don't. You know. Not saying something will happen if you don't watch them, but... Yeah. We'll see.